And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It's Thursday night. It's party time. We're the video bros, and we're on a whole new format here. I am Bobby Munson. That man beside me, you might not know him yet, but if you don't, let me introduce you to him. His name is Papa Smokes. There we wow. go, Papa Smokes. We're doing this in fashion here tonight on Thursday night. We are live both on YouTube and on Twitch here tonight under our own platform, the Video Bros Network. And we're happy to be bringing you guys the first ever edition live of Ring Respect Radio. And at the half, we're going to bring you the very first edition of our new MLW review show. That is called Fusion. Pop Smokes, I'm psyched. How are you doing tonight, man? Munson, I'm doing great. And I'm also real pumped up to be doing this again on our uh, live YouTube channel, doing it live, bringing it to the people, bringing it to the wrestling nations. I am loving it. And speaking of those people, we got Turnbuckle Studios. That's our good man, Carl, and also Joe over there. Good shout out to you guys and great job that you did on Turnbuckle Talk this week. Loved the show. Hell yeah, Bobby and Papa Smokes. You got that right. And our good friend, Ed Fries. Ole, sir. Ole. And we has also got another person here. Shout out to Cloud. Yes, sir. Good to have you in the in this show here tonight. Glad you could come on. And of course, the Chris Parrish man taking over on Tuesday night with Astrid. One hell of a show. There's been a lot of great programs this week, Papa Smokes. Again, we got great people out there like Turnbuckle Studios, Backbreaker Media, our good friend Mike the Ref doing some kick-ass stuff over there. Of course, Chris Parrish and Astrid kicking ass on Tuesday night. Uh, you know, everybody uh, from Melo and Andre doing their thing over at Backbreaker and also uh, on their own as well, too. A big shout-out to everyone that's putting out lots of fantastic fucking content and i'm allowed to say that because it guess what it's our own fucking show papa smokes and i'm gonna be myself for a change fuck yeah munson glad to hear it <laughs> and cheers to that as well too hey pop smokes i don't know if you've got a drink beside you but tonight i am uh i'm hitting up the uh number nine this is the uh small batch number nine this stuff is this is the good stuff right here we're doing oh, it big boy. celebrating the very first fusion and the first live Ring Respect Radio. For those who don't know, Pop Smokes and I have been doing Ring Respect Radio now for the good portion of about six years. I've been putting out episodes, talking about the history of professional wrestling and sometimes a little bit of a mix of the new stuff as well, too. Uh, if you have any questions for us there in the chat here tonight, please engage and let us know what you want to know from the two of us. But tonight, our main focus on the Ring Respect Radio side of things, we're going to be talking about the legend himself, Judo Jean LaBelle, a man that we lost just recently. It was on August 9th. At the age of 89, I believe, uh, he passed away in his sleep. But, man, talk about a guy who could still kick your ass from the grave. Papa Smokes, Judo Gene LaBelle. I had to come up with this one. I am a big fan. I've watched his training video so many times over because not only is it entertaining, but, damn, is there some good lessons you can learn from this man. Yeah, and uh, Judo Gene, a legend in his, uh, in his world, in the worlds of uh, pro uh, wrestling and martial arts fighting. And he's a guy that uh, really spanned the gap between uh, between the old style of American boxing and the, and the new uh, styles of uh, martial arts in the U.S. Uh, before Judo Jean, there was uh, only really boxing that was popular in the U.S. And Judo Jean brought all the other styles around to the people. Yeah, definitely. So, and uh, we're getting all the RIPs from the the audience as well, too. Thank you. And damn, Bob Smokes, if I'm looking correctly, I, did I just see 18 viewers up on that screen on a Thursday night? That's a big one, eight on a Thursday for the video bros. Boo, yeah, this is awesome. Way to go. We got Ed coming in. LaBelle is the LaBelle lock name from D. Bry. Uh, yes, I believe that would be 100% yep. true there, Mr. Ed. Uh, you bet. And then we got Jupiter Vision. Hey, y'all, all Jupiter Vision, thank you for joining in. And man, Mike the Ref is here. Mike, man, so glad to have you on a live, the first live edition of Ring Respect Radio for everything you ever did for Papa Smokes and I. Man, it is only possible that we're here today because you kept pushing forward for us. Thank you for everything you ever do. And Try 26, I know that's coming from you, Mike. You're helping out all the time. Love it. And move, moving on up, boys. You bet we are, man. I, I, I. I'm at a loss for words. When I see those kind of numbers pop up, folks, it just makes me absolutely humble. The people are ready to spend their Thursday nights partying with the video bros. Thank you each and every one of you for taking the time out. And yes, Parrish coming in. Uh, well, we got uh, Mike first, 25 people in here. 
And uh, so many viewers makes me wonder what's uh, love got to do with that. That's right. Get the VL. Ole, here we go. <laughs> so getting back to Mr. Judo Gene LaBelle here so we can get a little back on track. Of course, you know, it's, it's what we try to do inevitably here on the show. Uh, so he was called the Godfather Grappling, the Godfather of Mixed Martial Arts. This guy had what is known today as the very first MMA match in the history of our world. Yeah, the first te televised match in America for sure was his uh, match that came on TV in 1963 and a famous, famous TV event and uh, uh, no one will ever forget it. And like I say that uh, America's sport by this time up to the 60s was always boxing and they didn't uh, know or really trust the martial arts. And uh, when Judo Jean came in and, uh, and, and beat the boxer in the match, it, it was a, it was a, a watershed moment for sport in the U.S. It was it was that martial arts had come to stay, and uh, boxing wasn't necessarily the the strongest of the martial arts. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I want to know how much you know about the uh, ranks that Judo Jean was given over the years, especially in the two thousands uh, by the martial arts committees and stuff like the ninth a ninth dan in jujitsu. I I don't know if you got into the whole what that means in the world of jiu-jitsu pops folks but i'm pretty sure you're the knowledge guy around here so i'm going to turn to you on that one yeah well the way most dojos work it is that um you either either have a belt colored system where it's uh you get a a green belt a yellow belt a red belt purple and all the colors Th this is more for kids for a sense of uh accomplishment so that they don't give up a lot of the uh, classes for adults, you're a white belt until you're a black belt kind of thing, and there's none in between. But at any rate, um, a black belt would can take you uh, a 10 years to achieve, and then they say if you keep going hard, it's one year for each Dan level after that. Okay. But they get exceedingly more difficult as you go along those black belt Dan levels, and uh, some of them you will have to go to the country of origin of your martial art such as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu dojos, they will require that you go to Brazil and study and test under some of the masters. Same with the uh, uh, martial arts from Asia, Japan, Korea, China, all that kind of stuff. They can require that you go over and get your uh, higher Dan testing uh, uh, with the masters from the uh, mother country. And he was also given this honor as well, too, in the judo world. So both in judo and jujitsu. But it was in, I think, 2004, the World Martial Arts uh, Masters Association promoted him to a 10th degree level with them, too. So, again, that honor that goes up, the higher the number is. I don't know if anybody on record, at least in terms of fame-wise, has ever been on that same level as judo gene was. Yeah, uh, you have to be one of the greats, like pretty much a household name to have a 10th degree black belt in anything. Uh, I'm sure that some guys such as uh, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and such might have had 10th dans. It, it means that you spent your entire life studying this. And even the, those last one or two might just be decided and given to you by your sensei or your uh, instructor. And those numbers keep rising. I'm looking at the top there, Pops, folks. Thank you to everybody tuning in tonight. Damn, this is a great feeling. Thank you, one and every, all of you. Damn, this feels good. I'm at a loss for words. But again, back to Judo Jean. I, want, I know you're going to love this topic right here, but his trainer. He was originally trained in catch as catch can wrestling as well as boxing as well, too. So a very well-diverse fighter and was trained by someone I know you're going to know a lot about, Pops, folks, Mr. Ed Strangler Lewis. Yeah, and all wrestling fans know of Strangler Lewis's name, one of the greats of the 20s and 30s. He was a, a, a catch wrestler or a shooter or a hooker, as they like to call them, a guy that get, gets his hooks into you and you tap out sort of thing. Strangler Lewis, would, yeah, again, a household name, one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. He owned two decades by himself uh, where there was no one else close to his fame and skill level, so... Yeah, the thing I read said that LaBelle started with him when he was under 10 years old. So uh, imagine the uh, pedigree that that gives you and uh, and how tough this kid's going to end up being when he's uh, getting taught how to stretch from Strangler Lewis at such a young age. And yes, people listening in, Papa Smokes used the word hooker on our show here tonight, just for the record. <laughs> won't, won't be the last time. <laughs> 
That's right. Um, so let's talk about the, the televised MMA match as it is. Uh, this came about when uh, a professional boxer named Milo Savage basically made it very clear that he felt the boxing was the premier fighting style, that nobody on the planet would be able to defeat a boxer in any form of fighting. Uh, we got, well, I guess you have a parachute road here. Uh, can we not agree nickname, last name, as the actual name is so underrated? <laughs> That's a lot of that's a lot of name talk right there, Parish. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, Milo Savage, the boxer, he again, he, he believed that nobody could beat him in any form of fighting, and that's where Judo Gene, and this is going to become a theme as we talk about a couple of more events from Judo Gene's life, or at least one in particular. Uh, he says, "Well, you know what? To that, hold my beer, and we're going to prove you wrong." So Judo Gene has the first televised MMA matchup on TV against Milo Savage. And from what Judo Jean tells of the story, and again, Milo Savage might have told a different part, is that they tried everything they could. Look who's joining us, Papa Smokes. I yeah. know that name very, very well. It is wonderful for you to join us here tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate you. Awesome. Very awesome. Um, but yeah, my man. Um, so the as the, as the saying goes, Milo Savage apparently had greased up his gi going into this fight, making it near impossible for Judo G and LaBelle to be able to use his wrestling tactics or his, his ground and pound, his catch his catch can style against him. But uh, he also had put, uh, what was it? The brass knucks inside of the actual boxing gloves is the claim as well too. And yet, even with all this going in the favor of Milo Savage, Judo G and LaBelle still manages to go out and defeat this man took him to the limit and beat his ass right in that fight yeah i listened to a interview with labelle where he talks about that match and the savages corner had imposed so many rules concerning the fight right on the day of the fight that that hadn't been agreed upon before such as labelle not being able to use various takedowns yeah. and various strikes and uh that that's why uh, LaBelle's corner got Savage to wear the gi top because they had to make some concession in this or it was too one-sided. But of course, they didn't know the difference between a karate gi and a judo gi. So he's wearing a karate gi that's tighter and it's different. It, it's not the kind of uh, gi top that you use for grappling. So that was throwing uh, LaBelle off a little bit too. But in this interview, he just said, yeah, I, I wasn't going to get much of a chance to take this guy down. But he knew boxing as well. So LaBelle drew him in by putting his hands up in protection. But then he said he kept dropping that right hand so that so that uh, Savage would throw his right hand. And then he counterattacked from that. He drew him in with the counter attack a couple times and uh, took him down and then started to work the man. And of course, what can a boxer do when he's laying on his back on the mat and can't get up on his feet? There's not no legal attack or defense really that he can do. So uh, uh, I think Gene just worked him around for a little bit, gave him a few uh, twisted the arm, twisted the leg a little bit, and then uh, put him unconscious with the rear naked choke. Yeah. And uh, the fans weren't too happy about that because they were all boxing fans. Started uh, throwing beers and rocks and various things into the ring. And then uh, it ended up that LaBelle and his corner had to come back to the ring and revive the boxer because the referee in his own corner didn't know how to do it. So uh, they, they brought him out of the uh, sleeper hold kind of thing. And it still didn't make him any more popular that night. Yeah, and you know what, Daniel Bell, I mean, the, the story is going to continue into another attack that he he did that's become very famous with his name. He just had these moments that really make him stand out like a legend. And he goes and does that, takes all that heat from the crowd like a true, true fighter, and goes back there and still brings his opponent back up to his feet. Man, like, what an absolute legend to go and do that kind of work all in one night. When I mean, a crowd back then, especially a heated crowd like that, you don't know what those sons of bitches could have done. Yeah, there's somebody tried to stab him when he left the ring too, and it, it was a volatile crowd for sure. And things were different in those days too. People uh, didn't sit there and politely clap, clap and applaud their uh, their competitors. They they were fully invested in it and uh, wanted to try and do something about it. Yeah. 
So from there, we want to start talking a little bit about the wrestling side of things. Now, just so everybody knows, Gene LaBelle, more so an MMA judo guy and stuff like that, but he does have his place in professional wrestling. I mentioned about the wrestling training video that he's got that is thoroughly entertaining while at the same time showing you a lot of great wrestling holds and everything like that. I recommend going and check it out. You can find it on YouTube. So when you get the opportunity, definitely after this show, definitely uh, go over to YouTube and check out uh, Gene LaBelle over on uh, YouTube and find that uh, training video. Uh, Papa Smokes, if you used checked it out yeah yeah and i was also gonna say um the first time i ever knew in my life of judo gene labelle was when i was a tiny little kid in our house um we all had maybe it was the same for you we all had uh, the siblings and the parents had their own little collection of books and stuff but in the in the rumpus room or the family room in the basement there was a shelf with uh, all kinds of books uh just for anyone that if, from the family to read and on that shelf was judo gene labelle uh pro wrestling finishing holds it's called and uh it was it was my brother that came across that book and uh i was always fascinated with it as a kid and that's kind of ironic now because that that book is so so influential in pro wrestling for all the submission holds and uh many other finishing maneuvers that you see nowadays and throughout uh the seventies, eighties, and up till now. So that, that I, I was fascinated with that book as a kid, never realizing what an influential book for pro wrestling it was to become. Yeah, and we got shout out to Cloud saying old school wrestling clouds were filled with savages. Yeah, exactly. And you know what, Papa Smokes, I got to ask: Were you one of those savages back in the old days of watching wrestling? Did you ever get a little bit, a uh, little bit rough out there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. There may have been a couple of times when i was uh already smart to the business to a certain extent but still um with some guys and doing some drinking and stuff but we never attacked uh, any wrestlers physically or anything or or fans for that matter but uh so yeah yeah no i i i'd, I'd rather watch than be kicked out that's a fair assessment and i'm in the same same boat as well too got in there Ooh, the bad guys, cheer the good guys, do all that kind of fun stuff, just like you're supposed to do. But hey, sometimes you have a few too many Labruskis. You might get a little bit over over the top. You might say a few things you regret later, but oh yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, so Tudo Sheen, uh, speaking of the wrestling side of things, um, after retiring from judo, he ran the NWA LA territory with his brother. Um, I know you're probably a little bit more familiar with this side of things, Pop Spokes, with the NWA and the different territories. Um, did, were you very familiar with the one running out of LA? Um, yes, yeah, somewhat. It was the uh, the NWA's uh, territory for Los Angeles counties, so to speak, the, the main city of Los Angeles. It's called NWA Hollywood. And uh, yeah, yeah, they just just like any of the other territories, they uh, they ran spot shows. They ran uh, four or five big shows throughout the year. And this is going to lead me into um, a big part of what I want to talk about with LaBelle, too, is the Olympic Auditorium in Santa Monica in Los Angeles, which is uh inexorably a big part of uh of gene labelle's story because to skip back to the beginning he was born to the parent uh to parents that were promoters his mom was eileen eaton who is a famous uh boxing and wrestling promoter from los angeles from the uh from the 40s and 50s and 60s she worked her whole life and they uh they took over the olympic auditorium which had been a building since the early 20s but uh they leased it bought it so to speak took it over and started running boxing wrestling and roller derby as well as occasional concerts and stuff like that but it was a nice size venue of 10,000 odd uh capacity and um yeah that's where uh that's where labelle it's kind of funny because he went to martial arts and back to pro wrestling. But really, if you look at it, he started in pro wrestling because his family was involved in promoting that. No doubt that's how he knew Ed Strangler Lewis to, to be able to start training with him at age eight or whatever. And uh, the, their, their uh, family is just rich with the Olympic Auditorium, which is one of the more famous uh, pro wrestling venues. Um, not a thing anymore. I think the building still stands. I think it's um, some kind of a church now, but 
for the longest time it, it was it's been one of the uh one of the most famous uh wrestling venues I in america yeah you bet um so speaking back to when wrestling meets boxing here's another interesting fact we talk about for a minute judo gene labelle was a referee at one point in fact he was the referee for the infamous matchup when wrestling met boxing and muhammad ali took on Antonio Inoki. So, whether whether you like that match or not, it happened, and Judo Jean LaBelle was there to make sure things didn't get out of hand. Yeah, and that will also be a recurring theme in LaBelle's career, too, is that he was never, uh, I think, completely invested in being a professional wrestler or anything like that, but uh, the people at Olympic Auditorium and wherever he went wanted him around because he was a tough guy, and he was a guy that the locker room feared. So if you ever had any shenanigans, you thought something bad might happen. Perhaps there's a media scrum with a fight going to happen in the locker room afterwards. Maybe somebody doesn't want to drop their belt and is thinking of leaving with the belt after their match. You would have Gene LaBelle there at ringside and nobody ever tried anything on that guy. Well, let's speak about uh, his toughness uh, just outside of judo, wrestling, boxing. That, that That's easy enough, but a lot of people know that Stephen Skull's a bit of a legitimate tough guy, especially back in his day when he was putting out action movies. Gene LaBelle also has appeared in quite a few movies, but Stephen Skull had a chip on his shoulder that nobody could beat him up. There wasn't a man on this planet that could choke him out, period. And Judo Gene LaBelle said, once again, <clears throat> hold my drink. I'm going to prove to you why I'm the most badass mf -er on this goddamn earth. And he went out. And as the story is told, and again, there's some that try to dispute it, he choked out Steven Seagal on set and might have had a uh, not-so-pleasant accident uh, when uh, Steven Seagal soiled himself in the process. Yeah, I've heard that story for a long time. It, it seems hard to get confirmation or denial on this story, but... Uh... There are just as many people that say it's true that as to say it's false. But um, his, Steven Seagal is is uh, has some movies and and got famous for a while there, but isn't really a very likable guy in some circles. I don't think, including the martial arts world, there's a lot of question as to his toughness too. I think because he practices that Aikido, and it's uh, it's an art that it doesn't really so much involve striking and takedowns and stuff. It's using the opponent's own momentum. So if you've ever watched any videos of Seagal or some of the other guys practicing it, it looks cooperative. Like it looks like dancing kind of almost or gymnastics. So there's a lot of people that aren't really sure about Seagal and his art and all that. And I imagine LaBelle was one of them and, uh, uh, true or not, I, I don't think Steven Seagal could hold a candle to Gene LaBelle if, if they were to actually throw down. Yeah, and you know what? I love the story so much that I'm just going to make believe that it happened for sure because I want to believe that Judo Gene LaBelle took Steven Seagal down, period. But yeah, go check out uh, Judo Gene uh, definitely on, on film. He's been in many, many movies as well, too. He's got involvement in so many different things from writing books to movies to being in television, um, but also as a trainer. Like, we could talk about this for a minute. This guy is the man responsible for training, or one of the men responsible for training, uh, former UFC fighter and current WWE superstar, Ronda Rousey. Yeah, well, never mind Ronda Rousey. A, a lot of people, uh, including uh, Bruce Lee, who went to LaBelle to learn how to grapple because he could do all standing up fighting. But uh, he, he wasn't uh, versed in wrestling or jujitsu or any of the ground-based attacks. So he, uh, being both in the mu movie industry, he went to LaBelle and LaBelle worked out with uh, Bruce Lee for some say six months or so because uh, uh, Lee wanted it for his, uh, to round out his style for the uh, movies and all that. And there's also a story that may or may not be true that Gene LaBelle bitch slapped uh, Bruce Lee and uh, punched his uh, teeth in or whatever and... Uh, that that one seems to have no confirmation on it either. And uh, uh, LaBelle claims that he had a good relationship with Bruce Lee, but uh, yeah, just a tantalizing rumor to say the least. Oh, definitely. So um, got to ask you though, Papa Smokes, according to the question that's up on the screen, what would you say is the best Gene LaBelle movie? 
Geez, I'm not sure. I, I don't know a whole lot of them. He's been in tons of uh, martial arts movies, uh, a bunch of Sonny Chiba movies. He's been in one or two Bruce Lee movies. He's been in some Elvis movies. Like a lot of the times he would just be in some regular movie. But if there was a, a scene where someone got in a fight or someone broke up a fight, they would use an expert, right? They would have Gene LaBelle as the guy in there. So lots of them are just tiny cameos and such I, I don't think he was ever the star of any movies no. yeah and i mean again you could go check out his cameo in stuff like man on the moon where they're referencing uh and uh andy kaufman's time uh wrestling with jerry lawler uh you can also check him out in raging bull which is another classic as well too so stuff like that where people don't always know that gene labelle is there because he's that guy that maybe you don't know but now Hopefully that's the idea behind the show here tonight is that we'll get you familiar with the guy. And when you see him next time, when you're watching one of these classic films, you'll be like, hey, shit, now I know where that guy's from. I heard all about it on Ring Respect Radio. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to the talk of Gene LaBelle, Papa Smokes, before we turn it over to any possible questions or before we turn it over to the next edition of the show? Yeah, there's one thing I'd like to say, and that is uh, I was talking about the Olympic Auditorium in Santa Monica. There is... Uh, uh, a writing by the famous Los Angeles writer Charles Bukowski. If you're familiar with his work at all, he's a very, very famous uh, writer from, from Los Angeles. Uh, wrote a lot of stuff uh, from the gutter and from the bars and from Skid Row and all that stuff. And uh, I came across a nice quote, uh, Charles Bukowski on the Olympic Auditorium. This is a quote. Even the Hollywood boys knew the action was at the Olympic. Raft came and the others and all the starlets hugging those front row seats. The gallery boys went ape and the fighters fought like fighters and the place was blue with cigar smoke and how we screamed baby baby and threw money and drunk drank our whiskey. And that's the kind of wrestling era that Gene LaBelle comes from and uh, personifies. I just thought that quote was perfect for a talk about LaBelle in the Olympic Auditorium. Yeah, man, that's a perfect way to end off this homage to the legendary judo Gene LaBelle. We hope that you guys have learned a little bit. If you have any questions, feel free to share them with us. Uh, also, if you have any stories you want to tell us or, you know, matches or anything like that you ever want to share uh, from Classic Wrestling, always reach out to Pop Smokes and I. Uh, Pop Smokes, uh, while we're still on the ring respect topic, but as uh, many people may not be familiar yet because we have a lot of you here and some of you might not be too familiar with us. Papa Smokes and I not only have been doing Ring Respect Radio for quite some time, we also have been doing commentary in professional wrestling for some time as well, too. We started out as commentators, and that's how we met, was working uh, for HIW as commentators and, you know, grew this all, this friendship and all this from there. Uh, now we work for Prairie Pro Wrestling here in Saskatoon, and I just want to share, that's the poster coming up for next Saturday, Saturday, September the 24th. It's a September slobber knocker in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So if you're able to join us live, please do. But you can also catch matches starting to release every Saturday on YouTube where we call all the shots there on the commentary team. But I want to talk about the two listed matchups here with you, Papa Smokes. Uh, we've got, first of all, the main event for that night. It is the rematch champion, the first ever Prairie Pro Wrestling heavyweight champion, first and only, Sheik Akbar Shabazz. He's going to be defending against Cannonball Kelly and only his second title defense so far. Man, Cannonball was that close to winning the damn championship in the first place. What do you figure this time around? Does Sheik have it to go in there and pull it off or to one more time? Does he have the chance to retain? We know Tommy Gallivan took him to the limit last time out. Cannonball has been in his head a little bit. Does Cannonball have a bit of an edge going into this one? Well, and this is a rematch too. We've seen these two battling to attain the the PPW belt for the very first time. We watched them in uh, bat, uh, qualify for the uh, championship match in a battle royal. We watched them smash the hell out of each other in a ladder match. And now we've got a big title defense for Sheik Shabazz coming up with Cannonball Kelly. He asked me to pick it. It's a tough one to pick because these guys are very different. The Sheik is long and lean and likes to uh, break the rules and use a lot of strength. Cannonball, low center of gravity, heavy and likes to brawl, brawling all the time. He's he's fearless and merciless with brawling, and they will be out in the crowd. There will be metal objects used, steel chairs, all kinds of stuff. I, as far as rematch goes, 
rematches go i can't get enough of this one and i want to see more <laughs> i love this comment from mike Sheik will break cannibals back and make them humble <laughs> the announcement was paid for by the shabazz fan club Sheiky baby would love you for that one mike that's for yeah sure. yeah but at the same time cannibals got johnny two fingers the rock and roller in his corner man i love johnny he's fantastic and he can he can play a role he can play a factor in this she takes his eye off the prize gets distracted by by uh, Johnny on the outside, we could be seeing a new PPW champion next Saturday. Yeah, as as much as I like the Sheik and his reign of terror that he has going on in PPW, I, I think it's fully uh, within the realm of possibility that we could have a new champ that night in Cannonball <laughs> Kelly. Oh, this is this is a fun comment. This is something I would say to Sheik, but I would only say it while I'm online because I would never say that to his face because I'm uh, I, I'm actually afraid of the guy. He scares the bejesus out. Yeah, of him. <laughs> but yeah. Let's bring that poster up one more time because we got one more match we're going to talk about. We're talking about the grudge match. There it is. El Asesino taking on Colton Kelly. Colton Kelly, who just joined Prairie Pro Wrestling over the last little bit, just this year, he's had a couple of matches with us so far. He is undefeated, two wins at. at under his belt and he is now going to go against probably one of the most decorated professionals here in Saskatchewan and in Western Canada somebody who has held many titles he will go to the extent of anything to win he is dangerous he is violent he is El Asesino yeah this is going to be one hell of a clash and and like you say we've seen a couple of Colton Kelly's matches since he's been here he's very intense this guy doesn't come out to lose or draw a match. This guy comes out to win as well. So I think these two are going to hit head-to-head -head like a couple of mountain goats. I think it's going to be a battle of wills and a battle of egos. And El Asesino, I think, also some frustration there. His win-loss record since the, the debut of PPW is not so great. And you can see that he's getting uh, pissed off about that. You can see it in his attitude. It's even worse than ever, if you can imagine that. And uh, I think Colton Kelly's in for a real surprise. I think he's got his hands full and vice versa, too. This is going to be a, a match. I could see this getting out of control in a big hurry. It's going to get ugly. You know that Al Asesino brings trouble wherever he goes, but at the same time, <laughs> he brings quality inside that ring. So this is going to be one hell of a fight, one hell of a match. The PPW Nation are going to be excited for it, and we hope that anybody that's joining us is going to be having the hell of a time. But if you can't, again, we'll get that up on YouTube eventually for you. You'll be able to check those matches out down the road on our YouTube channel over there. 